in music and the other arts, we focus on what's beautiful. In science and engineering, we attempt to focus on what's true. Floating definitions, I think that these are all part of the same whole, seen from different points of view. Throughout most of my life, I've always played music. Uh, when I was seven years old, my mother, who was in her 30s at the time, decided she wanted to take up piano lessons again as an adult, so a piano appeared in the house. Um, she had her lessons, and she brought along some beginner books for my father, which uh, I started following along on. I was a, a fairly decent amateur as, as a kid. As soon as I got to college, I ran into multiple people who have already performed piano concertos with their mid-sized serious symphony orchestras. Still, I was pretty far down in the piano pecking order. For a while, I was a, a music major, actually at MIT, along with electrical engineering, That's before I became a music school dropout. The theory courses in particular uh, were very, very helpful in everything I did after. Since uh, it didn't look like I was gonna be a concert pianist, I played in rock bands, I recorded an album. The record that we recorded in the Capitol Studios also was, was almost an accident for me. Most kids who do that sort of thing, playing for their junior high school dances and things like that. When I entered college, one of my best friends, his freshman year best friend, who was in one of those bands, the guitarist had a writing contract with Electra Records. They did The Doors, among other things. The keyboard player that they had suddenly disappeared from the group. So they called me and they asked me if I'd sit in with them and I rehearsed a couple of pieces and then we went and did a couple of demos. It was on an 8-track machine in 1968. The Beatles had just done Sgt. Pepper in the previous summer on a 4-track, and so this was a huge deal for us. But nothing ever happened. Those inevitable artistic differences. Following that, I backed up folk singers in coffee houses in Boston. But I was living in a place that couldn't possibly have a piano. One day in February, in Mr. Bartley's Hamburger Cottage in Cambridge, reading classified ads for motorcycles. I stumbled on an ad for uh, a used harpsichord. So I figured, well, harpsichords, uh, they're quiet, and uh, I can practice, I won't disturb anybody. I bought the instrument, it was about the same price as the motorcycle that I didn't buy. I took it home, and the instrument was different enough from the piano technique. I would go all the way back to very elementary pieces, and it still was challenging to make them sound good. I went to the New England Conservatory because I figured I'd better get serious. Through graduate school, I started playing in ensembles. I did a lot of informal concerts. I ended up studying with Gustav Leinhardt, who was the foremost performer and teacher of the time. My cohorts there were the Fulbright Scholars. It enabled me to first understand that although I had much less repertoire than they did, I, I didn't think about music any differently. And that gave me a lot of confidence to go on to do some of the other things that I did. Lanehart suggested that I look up Professor Don Franklin at, at the University of Pittsburgh, who was a wonderful man. And Don Franklin introduced me to the people in the Pittsburgh Symphony that he'd been performing with. I was fortunate enough that he was out of town for two years, so I picked up um, most of the freelance work that he would have had. And that's essentially how I got off the ground here. It's very definitely the case that the experiences that I've had in music have really shaped what I've done as a professional. When I was an undergraduate in college, the Wendy Carlos album, Switched on Bach, first came out. It was a very early analog synthesizer. I was fascinated just at the idea that you can create music from electronics. I thought that what I really wanted to do was build a better synthesizer. That came crashing down against the reality that I was terrible at circuits. I migrated from hardware design, which I was never very good at, to trying to address questions of why do things sound the way they do? I was concerned with how do we perceive sound? What are the neural mechanisms that enable us to interpret and process sound? I drifted a little bit into speech processing, which was closely related. My former doctoral students include present or formal heads of the Siri Group at Apple, Microsoft Speech Group, Google in New York, National Security Agency. Some of these people have gone on to become very very successful. In mathematics and science, you talk about beautiful theorems, you talk about kind of neat algorithms. There is a quest even in the hard sciences and in engineering schools like ours 
for things that are not only true and useful but also elegant.